Hi, my name is Emily Weber. I'm a machine learning specialist at Amazon Web Services, and today we're going to talk about Amazon SageMaker. Amazon SageMaker is a fully managed machine learning service that developers and data scientists can use to build, train, and deploy machine learning models. Today, we're going to talk about notebook instances, and this is your deep dive. So with the notebook instances on SageMaker, it all starts with a notebook, right? And within the notebook, it starts with your EC2 instance. Your EC2 instance, that's your Elastic Compute Cloud. That's your virtual machine that's going to spin up and let us do all of our processing. This is a managed EC2 instance. That means that even though we're turning it on and off, it's not going to show up under our EC2 console, and we're not going to have SSH access to this machine. It's going to be fully managed by Amazon. We want to pick the right family. Your EC2 instance is going to come in many different shapes and sizes, and there are families of EC2 instance. T is the tiny. That's the smallest, most frugal, most humble option. M is slightly larger. That's going to have more memory and more cores. C is compute optimized, and P stands for GPU. After that, you're going to want to pick the right size. And this is going to range anywhere from medium to very, very large. You can have a lot of flexibility with selecting the right size on your EC2 instance. Also, you want to pick the right version. So every version of an EC2 instance is of the latest version that's been produced by the team. So that three that's highlighted, that stands for the most recent version in the T family. Um, the large number means that it came out more recently. And the latest version of an EC2 instance is always going to be more cost optimal. After that, we're going to want to add an EBS volume. And so again, SageMaker is a managed service. So this EBS volume is also not going to show up under your EBS views. However, SageMaker is going to be putting these two things together for us. And EBS has a really special property. That property is that it's going to be able to store data for us. So we want to get the size right. Uh, by default, you're going to get 5 gigabytes. However, if you're working on a machine learning project that has more than 5 gigs, which many, many machine learning projects do have more than 5 gigs, or we're going to want to pick the right EBS volume for you. And typically, I do slightly more than the amount of data that I actually need. I'm not trying to have a large volume and then be charged for it, but you want a little bit of breathing room. So, so pick something that's slightly larger than what you actually need. And then on top of that, remember that everything on that EBS volume is going to persist. So even if, even if we turn our EC2 instance on and off, for example, when we go home at the end of the day, in order to keep our costs down, we still want to hold on to that data set and we want to hold on to our code. And both of those are going to live on EBS. We also want to add or create a Git repository. And so those repositories are going to give us access to all of our code. It's how we're going to share our code with other developers and data scientists. And within SageMaker, you can add Git repositories that are automatically installed onto your notebook instance when it's created. After that, a few more settings. So we have security settings. This is going to include topics like encryption. Uh, if we're working with extremely sensitive data, we want to make sure that it's encrypted properly, uh, including root volume access to our instance. So if we need to shut that down under secure settings, we certainly can. Internet access is another component. If we want to disable internet access, we have full capacity to do that, in addition to connecting our notebook instance to our VPC so that it's locked down within that virtual firewall. Also, we have the option of using a lifecycle configuration. Your lifecycle config is a bash script that's going to run every time you start or create a notebook instance. And it's just a bash shell. So you can git clone, you can pip install, you can copy data from S3. Uh, that is going to have a timeout of right around 15 minutes. And so if you are installing a package that takes longer than that timeout, go ahead and drop in an ampersand in the line so that it actually runs in the background of your notebook instance. After that, if you want to run a machine learning model on that notebook instance, and we're going to cover all of the five ways that you can train models in SageMaker, locally is just one of them, but you certainly can, you can attach a portion of a GPU to that EC2 instance. And that is a new instance size that came out, new instance series that's called Elastic Inference. And this Elastic Inference is a portion of a GPU that you can attach directly to your EC2 instance in order to run inference locally. And you're going to want to select that based on your size, version, and bandwidth. 
after that, so you get your notebook instance created and then you'll click the button that says open Jupyter and that's gonna take you to this page. If you're new to Jupyter, we're gonna walk you through some of the features here. So first off, that is all of your data. All of the folders, all of the files, all the content that you wanna actually process is sitting right there in that list format. That fourth tab in from the right, those are 200 example notebooks that are managed by the SageMaker team. So actually, those are actually coming out directly from us in order to show our customers features that they need to know about. So if they're interested in understanding how SageMaker is gonna handle training machine learning models using R or using Keras or PyTorch or any other capabilities in addition to distributing data sets, what about put mode? All of those examples are in that folder. Also, over on the right-hand side, there's a new button. You can select the new button and then cruise down to create new notebooks and terminals. We're gonna learn about the terminal feature right here. So on the right-hand side, you select new, and then down at the left-hand side, you're gonna select create a new terminal. And then this is gonna open up your view. And so the terminal, that is something that exists within every Jupyter environment that folks are going to use. However, many of us weren't necessarily aware of it prior to using SageMaker because the most common places to develop Jupyter-based solutions are either on a desktop or they're on a server. And if they're on a desktop, we typically already have a Bash shell that's already opened up, so we wouldn't even need to see it within that desktop view. And if it's on a server, then typically we'll have a PuTTY or some type of other SSH connection that's actually getting us access to that server. And so in that case, we'd also have a separate terminal view. In this case, within the SageMaker Notebook instance, your terminal is really valuable because it lets you see what your instance is actually operating at on a line-by-line -line basis. So rather than the notebook view limiting you, you can drop all the way down to the Bash shell. Your EBS volume is gonna start at that SageMaker word, right? So you actually need to CD into SageMaker to get onto your EBS volume. And again, that's where your data is actually gonna be persisting. Okay, so uh, again, 200 example notebooks, definitely use these. So on the left-hand side, we're gonna see all of those folders. Um, those folders are broken out over different cases of applying machine learning, different types of machine learning algorithms, using R, different types of data distribution. Um, every time you select one of those, just go ahead and hit use and then create a copy. And that's actually gonna copy the files that you need to have into the home directory of your Jupyter Notebook. And then all of those example notebooks are open sourced. So on the right hand side, those are a GitHub, that's a GitHub site that's full of those 200 plus examples. Okay, so when you open up a single notebook, this is what it's gonna look like. First off, we have cells. This is a cell. Uh, each cell is gonna be broken down into either markdown or code, and you can see that right up there with that drop-down bar. A couple of other options, those are the two main ones. Markdown is gonna make your code look really, really nice, so you can get nice headers and nice list views, but when you need actual code, just switch that down. In the top right-hand side of your notebook, you're gonna see the actual kernel that you're running on, and your kernel is a way of executing code, right? So it's either Python 3 or 2, um, or R if you've installed it, or Anaconda, or any of the other capabilities that you're gonna need, and all those are gonna come with your SageMaker Notebook instance. And if you need to switch out your kernel, go ahead and do that. You've got the cell tab over there at the top, and you can also change it. So if for whatever reason, one of your variables gets destroyed because you were doing some awesome feature engineering technique that was a little bit tough, um, go ahead and switch out your kernel and you'll be good in no time. The next piece we wanna know about, so we're gonna need to import the SageMaker Python SDK. So again, that's an open source library that the SageMaker team is developing in order for us to use the methods that they've built. Uh, that's gonna include getting the execution role. Uh, that's gonna use an STS service that's actually grabbing the IAM policy that's associated with our notebook and then is giving SageMaker access to our S3 bucket. We're gonna have our SageMaker session and we're gonna have our default bucket. And so the default buckets, that is gonna live inside of every account. Um, it's gonna be created when you run that line. If you want to use your own bucket, go ahead and just paste in the name of the bucket name. Uh, it definitely surprised me the first time I started using Boto3, but I definitely grew to like it because um, so many of your services you can just get to using methods that are already built in. So you just need the name of your S3 bucket. Let's check out an example. This is our AWS console. 
Um, this is where we're going to look at all of our services. On the top right hand side, we're going to have the region that we're operating in. That is a physical location in the world where our services are going to be built, maintained, and stored. And so let's make sure we're in North Virginia. That's my default. Then we'll cruise down and we'll select Amazon SageMaker. Go ahead and type it in the search bar uh, if you need to find it. And then that's going to take us to our dashboard. The dashboard is going to tell you about ground truth labeling jobs you performed, notebook instances, training jobs, and inference uh, capabilities that you'll need. Let's select notebook instances. Let's cruise up to the top right hand side where it says create a notebook instance. Go ahead and type in a name for your notebook instance. And then under instance type, you'll see that there is a wide variety of EC2 instance that we, that we can pick from. And this is where you can get really flexible with your instance, right? You can absolutely start with something small, start with your, your T3 medium, but then you can bump up, you can absolutely upgrade. Um, and it's fun because you can do this on the fly. So after you've started running your notebook instance and then suddenly you realize that you need more memory or more processing, go ahead and bump up your EC2 instance. We'll leave this at the, at the T2 medium. You've got your elastic inference. You can just attach that as necessary. Uh, additional config. So this is your bash script, right? That's that lifecycle config that's going to run every time you create or start a notebook instance. And then here's your EBS volume. Uh, you can just specify any type of EBS volume size you're looking for. The max is 16 terabytes. Here's your execution role. So that's going to give you access to the services. Uh, here's where you can enable or disable root access. You can encrypt your notebooks. You can operate them securely using the VPC. And you can attach a Git repository. I already have a notebook created. We'll check this out. This is that home view. On um, the top right-hand side, that's where we can create a terminal. I'm going to cruise up to SageMaker Examples, so this tab right here, that fourth one. Again, wealth of information. Uh, in the first bar, Introduction to Amazon Algorithms, let's cruise down and select Text Classification DBpedia. Go ahead and hit Use, and then Create a Copy. And that's going to take us over here. Then uh, we've got a couple different options for running through this lab. Um, every cell, which you'll see, we can switch out from markdown to code. We'll leave as is. If you want to run a single cell, the keyboard shortcut is shift enter. There we go. So that's, that's a single cell. Uh, however, if you want to confirm that all of the cells in your notebook are operating properly, go up and under cell, select run all. And then that's just going to run through every cell in your notebook. And this is going to let you understand how this example operates. And so you see that empty space. So that means the cell hasn't been run. Um, while it's running, there's a little asterisk that shows you that it's processing. And when it's finished, you get a digit. That's the order in which that cell has run. And so you'll see in this first cell, this is where we're importing SageMaker. That's that Python SDK. Uh, we're getting our execution role. We've got our session. And we've got our default bucket. In this scenario, we're actually going to be copying a data set from the internet. Um, so this is from Saurabh. He's the author of the Blazing Text Algorithm. And we're going to be getting this uh, data set from his site. And then we're going to cruise down. And in this case, um, we're getting a DBpedia set. Um, so this is coming from Wikipedia. There are 500,000 articles. And all those 500,000 articles are tagged based on what category they fall into. So that's either author or company or means of transportation or natural place, 14 different categories. Um, and so here's the actual training data, as we call it. So each row is a sample from that data set. Uh, we've got the class right up here, then the title of that article along with the abstract. And so these are the different 14 classes that we're looking at. Uh, here's a quick little mapper that's just going to create basically a hash map um, from the index space to the string. And then here we're going to do some feature pre-processing. And what I like about this example is that we're doing this pre-processing in parallel on the notebook instance. So even though, even though we only have two cores on that T3 medium, we're going to be running our data through both of those cores using a MapReduce. And the kernel makes it super easy. Uh, so here's that single function right, that takes a row runs through the transformation, doing some word tokenizing. Uh, blazing text, you do need this little label here. 
um, little string specification. And then here's the actual MapReduce. Uh, so we're reading in all that data, right, appending it to this structure. Uh, calling shuffle, keynote here, you do typically need to randomly shuffle all of your rows. Um, most algorithms are going to assume that your data is going to come in in a random fashion. Uh, here we're only going to keep a percentage of those rows. Uh, then this is a count on the number of cores that are in that T3 medium. Uh, then we're going to look at the actual function along with all of our data structures. And then the result from that is our transformed rows, right? And so that comes out um, and here we go. And the, the rest we'll look at in, in the next section. I hope you like the demo. Uh, so some, some pro tips here. Um, so the first one is keeping your costs low by highly relying on Lambda, right? Lambda is your friend. Uh, Lambda is, is event-driven processing, so you can key it off of the time of day, you can key it off of an upload to S3, you can key it off of a notification that's coming in, um, but definitely use Lambda to turn your notebook instances off when folks aren't using them in order to keep your cost down. Point number two, resize on the fly. So in this case, um, we were able to run all of our processing with just that T3 medium, um, but let's say we wanted to use all that data, right? Not just the fraction. We could actually increase that notebook instance. So you just go ahead and select stop on your notebook instance and then edit your EC2 instance or the EBS volume. Both of those will recreate. Uh, the multi-threading we talked about, definitely a nice feature. And then that execution role, uh, keep in mind how you're actually attaching new policies to that execution role. And so that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Emily Weber. I'm a machine learning specialist at Amazon Web Services. I hope you enjoyed learning about notebook instances. Go ahead and check out our GitHub site, Amazon SageMaker Examples.